right now like i said i wasn't um i had an idea that you all wanted uh, an interest in orthoplasty um but i wasn't quite sure where to pitch this so if this like mahesh said if this seems very basic do move me on and we can discuss other interesting things that are going on in the approaches section to the hip now hip approaches so this is bristol sort of um home of the concord and the bridge so this is where unfortunately i don't work in any of these settings our hospital is nearly sort of more than 100 years old so it's quite a old building what we i was going to talk about is talk about the anatomy of the hip very briefly uh, then go through the sort of more conventional approaches the anterior approach the lateral approach and posterior approach and in india certainly when i trained many many years ago the posterior approach was the main one and then we'll talk about uh, some of the specific and new approaches that are coming through the utility of which remains to be seen and tested so the hip joint as you would know it's a ball and socket synovial joint the acetabulum is deepened by the labrum and the capsular attachments um, are those three ligaments which are essentially capsular thickenings an idiofemoral ligament of bigelow which is one of the strongest ligaments the pubofemoral ligament and ischiofemoral ligament in as such this doesn't necessarily play a part in the approach what does influence though is the nerve supply okay and the three nerves so the sciatic the obturator and the femoral nerve supply the joint itself mm-hmm. and then what we are specifically interested in is in the muscle groups that are supplied by those nerves so the flexors being supplied by the femoral nerve the abductors crucially superior inferior gluteal nerves and the adductors coming from the obturator nerve the hamstrings and adductor magnus i.e the posterior group and the adductor magnus is supplied by the sciatic nerve and we can start as we go through the approaches we can start looking at why each of them is of relevance as we look to explore every single plane that is available for hip surgeons and this is what probably the most crucial bit so the difference between arthroplasty and hip sparing approaches or hip preserving op- approaches would be this medial circumflex femoral artery so if by any mechanism if you're looking to do any hip sparing procedure you need to try and preserve the medial circumflex femoral artery if you're going to sacrifice it you don't really worry about this vessel and typically if you think about the approaches as a clock face i like to use this so if you're looking at an end on appearance from the greater trochanter uh, then you have the anterior approaches and the lateral approaches so and this gives you an idea about the intervals that these approaches go from so your posterior approach going between the short external rotators and the medius your direct lateral going through the medius and the variations of the same your watson jones approach going between the tfl and uh, the rectus around the front and then the smith peterson approach around the front as well okay and we'll go through these in a bit more detail so the anterior approaches as i club them under is the anterior conventional anterior approach which is the smith peterson approach the anterolateral approach which is the watson jones the lateral transgluteal and you have multiple variations in that and the most common approach that is practiced which is a direct transgluteal approach is the hardinge approach here and then there are variations on that which is the macfarlane osborn stakathro and harris and these approaches vary in almost the either whether you where you split the gluteus medius um and if like in the case of stakathro approach whether you take a piece of bone with it so as to stick it back down and then you have the more conventional chandli approach which is the transgluteal so transtrochanteric i e the trochanteric osteotomy that's very uncommon now and certainly for primary arthroplasty or even for revision surgery unless you are doing a extended trochanteric osteotomy this approach is not necessary and then we have some of those special approaches so the direct anterior approach getting a lot of attention nowadays popularized by huter and jude the gans approach which is a hip preserving approach in bristol we had the omega approach and we'll talk about that and then you have the new approaches which will come to in a bit so the anterior approach traditionally used for and i'm going to try and open this out for not just arthroplasty but other conditions as well anterior approach again not commonly used 
um but it's useful for open reductions of developmental dysplasia of the hip intraarticular fusions again thankfully not commonly done to make excisions the most common use certainly in the uk is for drainage of pus in kids and open reductions of ddh we started using this for hip debridements as well and now again more recently um it is used for total hip replacements and modifications of the same so essentially the incision is following the anterior half of the iliac crest and we'll see some pictures through this curving down to the lateral border of the patella and the internervous plane here is the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata superficially and that's why it's a internervous approach and deeper down it's the interval between the rectus femoris and the gluteus medius so your skin incision again if you wanted to do a big open reduction things like that that's what you would do so longitudinal incision so that if you had to do a sort of acetabular osteotomy then you could sort of peel off the apophysis and do your osteotomy and gain access from that point and your internervous plane is between the tensor fascia lata and the sartorius which is the femoral nerve and the superior gluteal nerve on either side and as you go deep down it's between the rectus femoris and the gluteus okay so it's kind of a true internervous approach if needed you can reflect both heads of the rectus femoris and then the iliopsoas goes medially then you can do a t shaped capsulotomy the structure to avoid in this approach is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh now what is the advantage of the anterior approach um it is an internervous and intermuscular approach okay so there is no muscle cutting involved unless you erase the rectus femoris it can be extensile again if you are using it to drain pus in kids then what we would do is almost a bikini crease incision so a transverse incision along the skin creases but if you were doing it for open reduction of the hip then you would go along a more longitudinal a more traditional approach so that you can extend it on either side inferiorly it goes into the iliofemoral approach so going around the front of the femur the disadvantage is you could damage the femoral nerve you could damage the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex artery and the main thing is it's not commonly performed it's gaining a lot of attention now like i said with the total hip replacements done through the anterior approach the anterolateral approaches the common features among all of these approaches and i doubt and correct me if um, may shot of patore uh, i don't think we do anterolateral approaches very commonly in india but it is a very useful approach so the patient would be supine or lateral uh, and in some cases they would be a sort of a floppy lateral position the incision is always based laterally over the thigh and around the area of the gluteal trochanter and then there is a flap of gluteus medius plus or minus vastus lateralis that you would take out uh, and the variations of the anterolateral and direct lateral approaches depend on where you go here but essentially the hip is always dislocated anteriorly the key success of this approach depends on meticulous repair of the gluteus medius to the greater canter so if we go to the watson jones approach the interval is between the gluteus medius and tensor fascia lata okay if you want to extend it you can't extend it very easily apart from doing a trochanteric osteotomy and then or with or without partial detachment of the abductor mechanism and the risk again is damage to the femoral neurovascular structures the key thing with this approach is that again the incision is based laterally you go through the sort of fascia and then you go in front of the gluteus medius between the gluteus medius and the tfl and that will get you directly onto the capsule then you incise the capsule and go forwards from there now practically i use it if i have to do open reductions uh, of femoral neck fractures so the rare occasions where you have to open a fracture then you can do fixation and reduction through the same approach and you can get a curved retractor underneath the gluteus medius to achieve the open reduction reduce it and then stabilize with the ky or something like that temporarily and then you get your fixation in so practically i use the anterior lateral approach i have done hip replacements through that and the thing that you need to remember is if you're using it the anterior lateral approach or the watson jones approach for hip replacements the key thing is having the patients in a slightly floppy supine floppy lateral position and then you will need a sort of a reciprocating saw to cut the neck because it's very hard to go get access to cut the neck uh, in this position going on to the lateral approach in this country 
it is used for hemiaphroplasty that's the standard approach all the sort of guidelines recommend that hemiaphroplasty should be done um so whether you're doing austin mors or which the modern hemiaphroplasty should be done through a direct lateral approach and that's to minimize the risk of dislocations it's also widely used for total hip replacement surgery and in some cases revision hip surgery but the proportion of the direct lateral approach for total hip replacements in this country certainly is on the sort of decline if you like so the skin incision is centered on the trochanter you go through the skin fat and subcutaneous tissue then spread the fascia and then identify the middle of the gluteus medius and split it you stay on the bone and then you lift the medius with the tendon and the vastus lateralis in continuity some people take the medius and minimus in sort of two layers and then take capsule separately and do a capsulectomy some people take it in one layer certainly when we do a hemiarthroplasty the common thing is to use a diathermy and go through all of them through one layer so there's the skin incision again pretty much same as or similar to the watson jones approach you go through the split in the fascia and this is the sort of area where you would identify the middle of the gluteus medius or somewhere there and either depending on what you're trying to do come down on the vastus lateralis or finish off here coming down on the lateralis allows you to have a good secure tissue to repair this back and the integrity of your repair will depend on this continuity and then you would get a decent exposure of the neck and the acetabular exposure is not that great but you sort of you can use retractors to try and lever it out in position which is why for hemiarthroplasties this is the preferred approach the crucial bit in this is the closure and that is sort of we i use a capsular stitch with two vicryl and then the abductors uh, i do a double layer so one interrupted and then one running stitch and again the fascia we use two vicryl uh, I no longer use clips so I would go subcutaneous on the skin. The main advantages of the lateral approach is that it is very easy to do. You don't require pretty much any assistance and you can do it with one nurse. The risk of dislocation does seem to be much better with the lateral approach. And the key thing is again if it's done in supine position there is very minimal setup you don't need specialized sort of props and things like that you're not worried about changing position. so that's the advantage with the lateral approach the disadvantage is it's not very extensile and the abductors do get violated plus there is a risk of damaging and defunctioning the abductors by damage to the superior gluteal nerve so this was the thing that was proposed so to try and prevent the nerve damage because when you split the gluteus medius it's very likely that as you are sort of trying to dislocate the hip that split can track further cranially and damage the superior gluteal nerve so one of the things that gets taught here is that putting a stitch in there um at around the 3 cm mark into the gluteus medius so that the split doesn't extend up and that's quite a good way of trying to minimize the damage however the superior gluteal nerve injury if you did emg on all of those patients is to the varies between 14% and 77% and the clinical evidence of damage is between 11% and 40% which is why in most cases certainly in this country it's been used for hemiarthroplasty so where the mobility is not expected to be that good so even if there is some damage and the abductors are defunctioned to a degree that is also the reason why you would go into the abductor so that you try and keep the bulk of the posterior abductors intact and then we go on to the posterior approach which is my preferred approach and i suspect for most of you that might be the preferred approach and it's mainly because it's very versatile so you have total hip replacements revision hip arthroplasty pelvic acetabular surgery and trauma surgery so you anything you need it pretty much is the single approach that would address most of those things and we talk about again position is lateral and you can use either a single prop or double props to keep the pelvis centered the incision is straightish with the flexed hip over the great trochanter then you go through the fascia lata and then you go through stay sutures through the external tears and capsule and then the key thing being the hip is dislocated posteriorly so i tend to take the external rotators and capsule in two layers i don't know whether that's the preferred way of how you guys do it but that's the idea behind it being then you can try and repair it as a sheet across and that does seem to minimize the risk of dislocation so the lateral incision is done you're going through the gluteus maximus 
and then you find the rotators so the piriformis the superior inferior gemelli obturator internus and then going on to the quadratus femoris if needs be along with the obturator externus the nerve gets swept back along with the fat and then bear in mind again this is a hip sacrificing approach you're using it for total replacement so you're not worried about the medial circumflex femoral artery and then you get onto the capsule and i do a rectangular flap of the capsule elevated and then put a stay suture through the edges of the same the big advantage with the posterior approach is it's extensile okay you can carry on so it's useful in periprosthetic fractures revision hip surgery if you want to do a trochanteric osteotomy it's very versatile um it preserves the abductor mechanism so and you get fantastic exposure on the acetabular side if you wanted you get 360 ex degrees exposure to the acetabulum with this approach and easy access to the piriform fossa and the reason why we talk about the piriform fossa is if you drop to k wire you'll see that the femoral canal is more in line with the piriform fossa and that is also why if you scrutinized some of the unless done very carefully if you scrutinize some of the post op x-rays done with a direct lateral approach you will always find the stem going front to back whereas with the posterior approach you're more likely especially if you're doing a cemented stem for that to go right bang on central on both ap and lateral views so if you ever encounter and again i know again in practice in india largely is uncemented but if you went down the cemented route the posterior approach is really useful and the piriform fossa entry is again very sensible to go down that route the disadvantage of the posterior approach is that you need a special assistance because at all times the hip needs to be moved in certain directions the sciatic nerve is at risk and so you have to be a bit careful there is that sort of traditional risk of higher incidence of posterior dislocation and there is a risk of avascularity if you're using it in hip sparing or hip preserving approaches so the posterior dislocation risk has been discussed multiple times but there are good papers to show that if you get a good posterior repair the risk is no different to the direct lateral approach and the key thing again with all of these approaches is meticulous repair back and then positioning of the components so if you get your components in the right place and test the stability intraoperatively uh, you will ban for achieve success the key thing is if it's not stable if a hip replacement is not stable intraop it's not miraculously going to stabilize in the postoperative period okay. the medial approach is again not for hip replacements it's the ludloff approach which is very rarely used i won't talk much about it but it is basically accessing to the lesser trochanter especially in open reductions in children if you have to do an associated so osteotomy it's quite a neat approach but you can't do much you, you can't extend it and there are limits to what you can do especially when the child is a bit older and we'll then move on to the sort of some some specific approaches so, so the gans approach which was popularized by gans for hip debridement surgery where he would dislocate hips then literally debride them all the way around take up all the osteophytes put some templates on and then get rid of anything that's impinging so he wanted to do the posterior approach so the best way to describe it is it is an posterior approach with an anterior dislocation and the idea being you try and preserve the medial circumflex femoral artery and the branches so it's uses in hip debridements labral surgery and of course in trauma surgery and what you would do is your incision would be in a similar place you would go down and then you would make a trochanteric osteotomy but sort of lift the muscle in continuity so a bit like the stachyathro but not quite and then your capsular incision goes anteriorly and then you would dislocate the hip anteriorly and then do your work on it by and far when you then relocate you can fix it with screws but by and far because the gluteus medius and the lateral radius is in continuity it falls back into place but you would stabilize it with a couple of screws uh, if needs be so that's the gans approach and it, it is crucial it is used by the trauma surgeons it is used by the pelvic surgeons on occasions but the key thing is for debridements now most of it is done arthroscopically so again in this country uh, hip arthroscopy is on the rise uh, and we would achieve all of this the debridement and the labral repair through an arthroscopic approach using the anterolateral and anterior portals and you would rarely need to do this approach the main advantage is it preserves vascularity 
it gives very good exposure. Um, but disadvantages is that it is a demanding approach. So that anterior dislocation through the posterior approach is a slightly tricky concept. You need to do your osteotomy in such a way that the medial circumflex is protected, but it's still a chunky piece of bone that will sit back in place, and there is a risk of trochanteric non-union. Omega approach, I'll go quickly through because it was popularized by Professor Learmont, who um, was our trainer, mentor. So it's a variant of the direct lateral approach where the entirety of the gluteus medius is elevated along with the vast vastus lateralis. And the idea was that A, we would get good exposure, but we would also avoid damage to the superior gluteal nerve. That was the original omega. It gives fantastic exposure without an osteotomy, but unfortunately, the reattachment has to be meticulous. And then there was the modified omega approach where you go through, you take most of the gluteus medius, but leave thin sliver behind. So that's how you would do it. So you have the vastus lateralis and you can see that how far behind this cut goes. And then you come in like an omega and go into the vastus lateralis. You have to make sure that you have decent cuff of tissue on either side to help. The direct anterior approach, as I said, sort of proponent was Huter and popularized by Jude. It's muscle sparing. It's gaining popularity, uh, certainly in the UK. I know it's very popular in America and certainly on the continent. The main advantages, as we talked about the direct anterior approach earlier, is internervous, it's intermuscular, the rehabilitation is quicker, a lot of day case arthroplasty surgery advocates would use this approach. Um, the restrictions, there don't seem to be any, uh, because it's an intermuscular approach and you don't do a big resection of anything. It is talked about that it gives better leg length and stability. However, it's a big learning curve, it's not for everyone. It certainly needs specialist equipment, and sometimes it has to be done on fracture table type of set setting with image intensifier guidance. Not in all cases. There has to be a sort of, there are people who do it in all cases, but by and far, it's better for uncemented implants, and it's not extensile. Okay. So, and there are exceptions that if you've got a large fat, there is some incidence coming of increased infection rates because the incision is so close to the groin, but we'll wait and see how that goes. And then I was going to talk about some of the new approaches before we finish, and I'm happy to take any questions either now or at the end of it, is the piriformis sparing approach. Now, this has been in existence for a long time. So it's the same posterior approach, but instead of taking the piriformis along with the obturator internus and the gemelli, you just take the in external rotators, you keep the piriformis. And the idea is the piriformis would be the main stabilizer of the hip, and it would be that um, it would give you some early stability. Now, the tricky thing with the piriformis sparing approach, and there are two good papers from Australia that I would recommend uh, by Khan et al, who they did this study 10 years ago. And at six months, yes, the rehab of piriformis sparing approaches early on is much better. But if you look at six months, they will all have the same outcome. And when you look at the piriformis sparing approach, and they did some MRI studies, you will see that even with the piriformis sparing approach, there is an element of damage to the piriformis. Okay. And then the superpath approach, it is supposed to be superior to the external rotators and percutaneously assisted sort of total hip replacement. And basically you do an approach almost like you're doing a nailing. So you do an approach superiorly. And what you would do is go between piriformis and gluteus minimus. You would go in from there, open the canal, put your rasps in from that point. And once your rasp is in and tested, then you cut the neck. And then what you do is you get access to the astablum and then you make a separate incision further down, move the femur out of the way. And then almost, if you think of the dreamer, you put it in the socket through that superior hole that you've made. And then the reamer handle is connected. So it's a bit fiddly. It by and far does need image intensify in my view, although there are people doing without it. So I'm, I have to say I'm not convinced by it. And then the last one in that series is the SPARE approach. And SPARE stands for sparing piriformis and obturator internus and repairing externus. The thought behind this is the piriformis and the obturator internus and the gemelli are the main drivers of the hip when you're getting up from a sitting position. So when you're rising from a chair, those are your strongest 
muscles in action that will help you get up. Okay, so it's useful for better function in hemiarthroplasties, and it's useful for better function in total hip replacements, or at least that's the idea. And it does need some special kit, but not much. So you can have some special retractors that allow you to protect the obturator internus with the gemelli. And you go between that and you take the quadratus femoris and the obturator externus off and you approach the hip through that gap. And you need specialized assistance for that because you have to go, the, your assistant has to hold it as you're lifting the obturator internus out of the way. Your assistant has to abduct the hip so that it is detentioned. So it's a bit of a tricky approach, but it's being popularized at the moment, certainly in Exeter and in areas around Exeter, um, a lot of the hospitals are there. At the moment, it's going through a sort of randomized control trial and we will know the results hopefully in the near future. So it's not popular, but it is gaining some traction. These are the references that we would have along the um, the stuff that we discussed for these new approaches. So the piriformis sparing approach, the Khan et al. paper that I talked about from Australia, and then the superpath approach, and then the spare approach used by John Timperley, or sort of who's, who's kind of come up with that approach. Essentially, all of these approaches are new, and the difficulty is hip replacements are so successful that it's very difficult to prove an improvement. Uh, the power required of that study is massive, and by and far, at six months to a year, most um, hips in that category, whichever approach you use, would be doing well. The key thing for certainly in these countries is the pressure on beds, which is not such a big issue in India as far as I understand. So the drive to get those patients out of hospital as quickly as possible and day case arthroplasty and things like that is what is driving a lot of these innovations in approaches in hip surgery. Uh, that's more sort of the textbooks that we would use and more references. Uh, and I can provide those for those people that, that wish to read more about it. Right. That's that. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to take any questions. And hopefully that was useful. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjit, um, for an excellent presentation. Um, we have one question which has come on the chat box. And that's. Um, can you kindly give some practical um, tips on the repair of capsule if the capsule tissue is friable or uh, in elderly age group, especially in trauma with neck femur fractures? Uh, what is your <coughs> go-to method of repairing the posterior soft tissues? Now, the so the posterior soft tissues, and, and that's a good question because yes, we do see it from time to time and especially in the arthritic hips as well, not just in trauma. And that's why that's my logic in taking it off in two layers. So in those situations, in most cases, the capsule is contracted, but you can mobilize the external rotators. So you can get a capsular stitch or in say revision scenarios, it's a slightly different issue, but you can still mobilize. If you imagine like the rotator cuff, the piriformis and the external rotators can be mobilized quite significantly. And you will still get a sheet of repair from the external rotators, even if you can't get the capsule. So if the capsule is friable or if it doesn't come across, that's not a big worry. And that's what I would suggest that you take it off in two layers um, and then you'll find that it's a lot easier to repair. So then what I do is I would put a stay suture through the external rotators and the capsule, and at the end of it, you split those sutures. So you take the top two and the bottom two, and then pull it through transosseous um, drill holes with a 2.5 millimeter drill, and that will help. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Dr. Pachore, do you want to ask something? I can't hear you. I think it's on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Say so yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, I missed the connections. Can I just interrupt a little bit? Yes, please, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, the anterolateral approach has been also, uh, has been increasing uh, in our country. Not that uh, we are uh, not all, most of our posterior surgeon. As a hip surgeon, I think it's very important for uh, everyone to know the, uh, what, uh, Mahendra described was the anterior approach, which is coming up. Anterolateral approach, uh, anterior lateral approach is also a very important approach, especially I'm talking about fracture neck femur when you want to do total hip. Uh, 
and hemiarthroplasties, Parkinson's, spastic patient, uh, patient with a cup size less than 44, 46, where the head uh, is going to be at 28 millimeters or so high rate of dislocation. So no question about it. I think the anterolateral approach has been, um, uh, should, uh, you should be able to do it. Regarding the limp he was discussing, I think very few patients, they develop a limp for six to eight weeks. But after that, you see them, they, they just recur. These EMG studies are little on the fa fallacy, or quite a lot of fallacies. fallacies. Uh, very uh, rarely, if you extend more than five centimeters and above, then you have chances of uh, getting a superior gluteal nerve damage. Damage. So I've been now using last five years, four five years. I have been using a more, quite a bit of anterolateral approach, except where very difficult primaries and revisions I do are posterior. But by and large, I have shifted to an anterolateral approach for last four to five years. And uh, reason is dislocation rate is extremely low. And second important thing is there are no precautions precautions for post posterior dislocation where we are using in posterior approach approach. Uh, no question about it. So that is uh, my take and uh, young people should learn uh, dead anterior, anterior approach in a specific group of patients, not all, because the complication rates are extremely high and our hips are on the stiffer side. Our hips have little problem. So one has to be very careful in our country, but straightforward avian and other uh, situation with a good, lear good learning Training, I think uh, that is approach. I think uh, one uh, younger surgeons must learn this approach. Pachar, it's a very valid point. And I think I would echo exactly that, that I think we there is there are Cochrane database reviews which show there is no difference in abductor function. The only issues come if you don't do a meticulous repair afterwards. And again, I, I go to the to the sort of bit that I've talked about that whichever approach you use, you need to know how that approach works and what the repair mechanisms are. So that's the crucial bit. Once you achieve that, you will achieve success. The key thing being the risk of dislocation. And I agree with the superior gluteal nerve injury. The EMG studies, bear in mind, these are done within the context of studies. So you would not normally go about doing EMG studies in a patient who's functioning well. Okay. So that's, that's where I would say that. And I completely agree that as a hip surgeon, you need to be able to do all approaches and then you have your preferred approach because you'd never know where you would need a specific approach. So, for example, you go in and suddenly the trochanter is bare, that the abductors, especially in the elderly people, somebody mentioned earlier that if the abductors are already detached, then in that case, if you go through the posterior approach, you will invite trouble. So, in that case, again, going through the direct lateral approach or the anterolateral approach is advantageous and then repairing the abductors back. Another question has come up on the chat is some insight regarding Zimmer's MIS2 incision technique. So the, the Zimmer technique, I'm presuming you're talking about the superpath again. So the two incision, there have been various iterations of it. I have to say I have no personal experience, but what I've seen of it, again, bear in mind that all of these innovations are intended to try and improve the early rehabilitation. It has no bearing on component positioning. So whilst I would bring you back to Dr. Pachoresa's comment that what you need to do is to do it properly rather than go with the new most next fancy thing. So the if you think of the superpath approach, if you look at the two incision where you introduce the retractors through a separate in sort of the reamers through a separate incision and the reamer handle through a separate incision. That's where that two incision surgery came in. We had the anterior version of it. And personally, I'm, I have to say I'm biased. I don't see any advantage in it. Uh, can I, uh, Mahesh? Yes, sir. I think Richard Berger is the only person who <laughs> would describe and yeah. who practiced and he himself went away. I think that approach should be out of question. Out of question. There are a lot of complication, complication rate and uh, uh, a lot of uh, you have to use a lot of image and a lot of uh, radiation which takes place i don't think uh, today we are uh, we are talking about this to uh, approach at all i think out of question now only one thing i want to uh, emphasize also once in a while as a hip surgeon you must know how to do the trochantic detachment what the channel described maybe little modification here and there because in our country we do have a, a difficult hip sometimes Sometimes ankylos hip where you are not able to see the neck or sometimes you are not able to dislocate the uh, Austin Moore's where right in protrusion inside. 
that is a time i think one must learn also trochantric uh, trochantric dress so that it is uh, easier to dislocate them and uh, do the job so and uh, uh, wire the trochanter back so do not worry about the wiring the trochanter it has got a good use. if you use it proper uh, technique uh, the union rate is something like 98 to 99% so uh, this also as a hip surgeon you got to learn this approach yeah i couldn't agree more yeah how is the uh, how much is the surgeons in uk chasing the direct anterior approach i mean we see that there is a plethora of surgeons in the us and some of the european countries um taking it on and i have discussed with dr pachore in the past as well the need for learning this approach and utilizing it in our practice what is the uk take on the direct anterior approach there are pockets of it uh, and those who are doing certainly people who've done fellowships on the continent uh, are proponents of the anterior approach and the direct anterior and the main drive like i said is this take is arthroplasty but going back to the point about hip restrictions one of the major advantages of this is there are no restrictions you get the patient walking for the patient there is apart from the dislocation side of things there is no advantage but at the moment in the uk it's mainly in some of the london hospitals and in the north it is picking up but it's a very small proportion so if you looked at the national joint registry it's a very small proportion of patients who are doing the direct uh, uh, getting the direct entry approach in bristol we we tried it and again we had some early complications but the body habitus is such that like patrick has mentioned that it's it's not for all patients and rather than keep on changing the approach i would rather do one approach that is gives me consistent results but i have the other approaches if needs be um so in answer to your question not much but it will pick up in response to the market pressures i'm sure yeah okay so let's see if there are <clears throat> any more questions otherwise we can move on uh, so i think thank you very much sanchit for sparing some time i know it's working uh, day for you and you are at the hospital so we won't hold you for long i think um, thank you again and we will try and involve you more uh, in the future um you if you are most welcome to stay uh, but if you feel like you have um, to go back to work please do so thank you sanchit thank, thank you very you. much it was a pleasure Yeah, yeah. I'll hang around for a bit and then I'll 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 go. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So the second speaker for tonight is Dr. Arun Kannan from Chennai Apollo Hospital. He has um, kindly agreed to talk about um, the utilization of the cruciate retaining versus the posterior stabilized knees. So Arun, can you start sharing your screen, please? Sure. Thank you, sir. sir is my screen visible sir yes yes yeah. you we can see it so <clears throat> so in this talk i will try to uh, sort of uh, talk about the concept behind uh, peels and cr rather than about uh, which is better we'll see how each works and how each works differently i think that is how i have uh, taken up this talk so we'll look at uh, what the role of uh, pcl uh, is in tkr and then how a uh, ps knee compensates for the loss of pcl and then uh, technical variations uh, that or technical issues that happen specifically in a ps knee and in a cr knee so <clears throat> so i think this entire debate started uh, in the hospital of special surgery in new york where dr peter walker head of the department and he had dr insol and dr anagat working on uh, knee models and this was the first uh, sort of globally used knee that came out the total condylar knee by uh, dr reinsal ranawat and dr walker where they sacrificed both cruciates and the femoral component almost looked like a, a quite a little bit like a cr component and the tibial component was an all poly with a peg for fixation so <clears throat> here the crucial thing is that they sacrificed both the cruciates and did not do much to compensate for it 
So this was the sort of first uh, successfully used uh, knee model around the world, but we'll see what the problem with that was. So with this knee, uh, the flexion was limited to an average of 90 degrees. Most patients did not get flexion beyond 90 degrees or uh, had less than that. And it was not that they had instability because PCL and uh, ACL were taken off. Instead, because the flexion was limited and they saw a lot of tibial loosening with this. We'll see shortly why this happened. <clears throat> so, and this largely depends on the concept of uh, femoral, posterior femoral rollback that happens in the normal knee and that we should try or we try to replicate in a replaced knee as well. So, in a normal extended knee, the contact point between the femur and uh, the tibia is quite anterior and uh, as we flex the knee, the, the contact point moves posteriorly as shown here, the green dot. And uh, this is called the posterior rollback of the femur. So when this rollback does not happen, then flexion becomes limited in the knee joint. So this concept of rollback is very crucial to understanding the difference between a CR and PS knee. So this was a very nice study that got published in uh, 2005 where they had an MRI of the knee done in various degrees of knee flexion in normal people and they found out how exactly the femur and tibia move on each other during knee flexion. Here on the left is, the, is a sagittal section through the medial uh, aspect of the knee and uh, the middle one, mark B, is through the lateral uh, condyle. So you can see that both have moved posteriorly as the knee flexed. You can see that the knee is flexed and MRI is taken in that position. The lateral condyle has literally subluxed off the tibia in this high degree of flexion. So that is how far posterior rollback happens. Medial rollback is only uh, about 3 to 4 mm on an average, but the lateral rollback is about 19.2 millimeters or almost 4 to 5 times what happens on the medial side. This is described more as a medial pivot, meaning the medial side also moves posteriorly but less. The lateral side moves a lot posteriorly. So the important thing for this talk is to remember that both move back and that is called the posterior femoral rollback. And this is crucial to achieve good flexion in the knee joint. How this happens in the natural knee or the native knee is because of the shape of the articular surface. We all know that the medial side is uh, quite concave uh, geometrically and the lateral, si uh, lateral side is not, uh, is almost uh, flat with the posterior slope. So <clears throat> these are factors that uh, influence rollback and apart from this is the four bar linkage formed by the attachment of ACL and PCL. So this diagram show, shows what happens. So as the knee goes from uh, extension to flexion, the cruciates maintain the four bar linkage and pull the femur posteriorly. So this is how a normal knee achieves rollback. <clears throat> so uh, when both the ligaments are lost or not functional, um, here we have shown a total knee replacement. Uh, this is a CR design, but I think the cruciates are not functioning. Uh, meaning the posterior cruciate is not functioning. So the initial contact point in extension is marked by the blue arrow. And uh, as the knee flexed, the contact point has moved anteriorly. This is called paradoxical anterior translation. And this happens when the cruciate ligaments both are lost. Especially when the PCL is lost, the tibia sort of subluxes forward, uh, subluxes backward, and the femur, or, contra or uh, conversely, the femur is pushed anteriorly. So what happens in this, I have tried to show in this diagram. So when the femur rolls and uh, paradoxically moves anteriorly, what happens is that the cortex of the femur goes and hits against the posterior aspect of the tibial component. So I have marked that with an arrow. So this is what happens when the femur is not rolling back or rolls in a paradoxical manner anteriorly. However, if the femur is able to roll back, there is no impingement happening, meaning the, uh, as shown in this blue arrow, um, the femur has rolled back and it is able to achieve good flexion. So the concept of posterior femoral rollback is not only important for uh, the PCL is not for mainly stability, 
but to achieve the posterior femoral rollback. <clears throat> if rollback is not achieved, the femur will hit against the posterior lip of the tibial component and limit flexion, but also cause loosening in the midterm to long term. So, um, initially, these people, uh, especially Dr. Insal and Burstein, they came up with this idea of a posterior stabilizer. As I told you, the total condylar process initially came up. It did not have rollback and had limited flexion and early failures in many cases. So, to compensate for this, to achieve a posterior femoral rollback in a total knee replacement with both ACL and PCL gone, these two people came up with a very uh, interesting idea of the posterior stabilized knee. So, <clears throat> the central component of the PS knee is the CAM and post mechanism. I, I mean, uh, for many years uh, since I joined orthopedics, I didn't pay attention to the CAM, uh, which was part of the PS component. We all thought, uh, I mean, uh, for a few years initially, I thought PS was more about that uh, post that happened that is there in the tibia. That is only one part of the PS mechanism. The CAM is a metallic bar that connects the posterior aspects of both the femoral condyles of a, the femoral component. And this is called the CAM and this is central to the PS knee. So the post itself does not, by itself will not give any stability, medial lateral stability or very little rotational stability to the knee joint. So the PS knee does not innately have any more medial lateral stability than a cruciate knee in general. So the purpose of the post is not about medial lateral stability, <clears throat> but is about achieving rollback. So uh, this diagram clearly explains what happens with the, uh, the cam post mechanism. In extension, the there is no uh, relation between the cam and the post. The cam is right up here and the post is here. So in extension, there is nothing that is happening in a PS knee. In extension, PS knee behaves same as a uh, CR knee. So there is no additional uh, stability in or no additional uh, mechanism that is happening in a PS knee in extension. As the knee flexes, you see uh, at about 70 degrees to 90 degrees of flexion, the cam comes in sort of uh, engages against the post as shown in the uh, the right part of the diagram. So here the cam has engaged against the post and here the femur will not move anteriorly, meaning the femur is held back by force using this cam and post mechanism and this reliably achieves posterior femoral rollback in a PS knee. This is the central mechanism how a PS knee works. The post again is not about stability, but about achieving rollback. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I mean, uh, of course, all of you know, would have known that uh, this uh, Insal and Burstein popularized uh, PS knee became a hit, and uh, we still use a little bit variations of the same design even till today. At the same time, the same group they worked on a cruciate retaining knee that was called the duopetlar knee. So they retained the PCL and did a knee replacement. And uh, but they found it initially uh, technically difficult as compared to a PS knee, or rather, I must say that they, in their own words, they found the PS knee easier to uh, balance and work with. So they sort of stopped using this duopetlar knee, which is a which is almost the forefather of the current uh, cruciate retaining knees. However, another group from Brigham, uh, they continued to use the duopetlar knee, which is a, a where the PCL is retained. They made some minor modifications. They retained the PCL and did a cruciate retaining knee. This was almost uh, one of the first uh, successful designs of the cruciate retaining knee. And even today, the PFCCR knee from Depew is almost a very minor modification of this knee that was used for uh, almost 40 years back. So the initial inventors gave it up, but another group found it useful and they were able to achieve very good results with this cruciate retaining knee. That is how the cruciate retaining knee came into existence. And we still debate about which is better and which is uh, worse. So <clears throat> here in the cruciate retaining knee, the PCL drives the rollback. So we need rollback, whether it is a cruciate retaining knee or a posterior stabilized knee. We need something to 
do the rollback of the femur in the PCL uh, retained knee or the CR knee. This is done by the PCL if it is balanced well. So when the PCL is there, it doesn't allow the tibia to sag posteriorly uh, if it is well balanced. Just like what we, I mean, uh, so uh, like what we test for a PCL deficient knee. If PCL is not there, the tibia subluxes uh, <clears throat> posteriorly and this will prevent rollback. If the PCL is present and well balanced, it will keep the tibia forward and the femur will roll back posteriorly. So, <clears throat> About, uh, I'm sure we cannot, uh, I mean, talk, uh, we cannot uh, have a talk where we don't discuss uh, pros and cons of these. But uh, what, I mean, what the basic message is that both CR and PS knees have been in existence for about 40 years plus, and both have good results. Both have very good results as far as, uh, I mean, a lot of studies, meta analysis, and uh, systemic reviews have been published. There isn't too much difference between the success or the revision rate or uh, survivorship of CR and PS knees as of now. We are now starting to see some evidence uh, for one versus the other. But consistently in all um, or in many studies, in uh, many randomized trials, PS knees or the posterior stabilized knees achieve a more reliable, higher flexion than cruciate retaining knees. This is because in the PS knees, the posterior femoral road back is very reproducible and uh, sort of forced by the cam post mechanism. However, in a CR knee, the PCL is balanced, it will achieve good flexion and roll back. The CR knee, the PCL is not balanced well. If it is tight or too loose, then it does not work well. There have been no other differences in other midterm outcome measures like pain, stability, function, or knee, knee society score between PS and CR knees. So, some data is emerging from registry, uh, even Australian registry, uh, the UK registry. Both are beginning to show uh, a slight difference in the survivorship between the CR knees and PS knees. Here you can see that the green line is the CR knees and that shows a slightly lower revision rate as compared to the blue line which is uh, representative of the posterior stabilized knees. So, and they have uh, shown that it is, there is some statistically significant difference in the survival, but it is not a big difference. Uh, the other uh, caveat in uh, interpreting uh, registry based data on survivorship between these two is that many of the complex knees are done as PS knees, especially knees with FFD and um, other uh, defects. Uh, so, may not be a very great comparison, but again, Austrian registry has put out another uh, comparison that compares surgeons doing only PS knees versus surgeons doing only CR knees and they still find that there is a slightly better survivorship with the CR knees but it is too early to say of a very I mean sort of a very prolonged debate so we'll have to wait on the revision rates for more data. <clears throat> so the posterior stabilized knee there are some technical modifications that we need to do or uh, keep in mind when you do a PS knee. So this is the most important thing. Once you take out the PCL, it increases both extension and flexion gap, but it increases the flexion gap a lot more than it increases the extension gap. Once you resect the PCL, the extension gap increases by about 1 mm on an average. However, the flexion gap, once you fully take out the PCL, increases by about 4 to 5 millimeters. So this is the central thing that happens once you take out the PCL and you want to balance the knee joint. So uh, what do we do? Uh, normal knee slope, uh, the tibial slope is um, in many of our Indian patients, it is uh, well above 3 degrees. It's somewhere uh, on an average uh, 7 to 10 degrees for many of our patients. And this has been published on Indian data as well as uh, Western data. It is definitely more than uh, 3 degrees. However, in a PS knee, we do not give that much slope, meaning we do not give the native slope that is existent in the human knee joint. And this is to close down the flexion gap that is increased because of the PCL sacrifice. So generally in a PS knee, the maximum slope is 0 to 3 degrees. And this is done mainly to limit the uh, flexion uh, looseness that we can uh, sort of see sometimes in PS knees. 
So, <clears throat> if we do not take good care uh, in uh, maintaining flexion balance in PS knees, a lot of them can develop flexion instability, meaning it is lax in flexion and it is uh, balanced in extension. So, this was a patient who had a PS knee with a slope of about 9 degrees and uh, had symptomatic flexion instability and uh, revision, um, both components were revised. Uh, the slope you can see has been changed from um, uh, uh, about uh, 9 degrees to about uh, 3 degrees with the stemmed component. Other adjustments were also done, meaning the uh, femoral component has been uh, upsized. Uh, you can see that uh, the posterior condylar offset has been increased at the time of revision. So the errors to avoid in a PS knee are not to undersize the femur. If you undersize the femur, especially if you're using an anterior referencing system, you again increase the flexion gap. And do not under resect, do not uh, be very conservative in your distal femur cut. Because if you under uh, resect, then the extension gap becomes tight and the flexion gap becomes loose. So do not undersize the femur in PS knees and do not under resect the distal femur. So these are two uh, things, two errors to avoid in a PS knee along with maintaining a proper tibial slope, which is about on an average zero to three degrees in a PS knee. The other thing to uh, take care of in PS knees is that um, if you allow a laxity in extension, if the PS knee is lax in extension, then the anterior of the femoral uh, component can go and hit against the tibial post. And you can see that there is an anterior post impingement in hyperextension and that has resulted in a bear in this part of the post. So in a PS knee, generally you cannot allow hyperextension. The degree of hyperextension that is allowable in a PS knee depends on each component. Like some, con uh, some companies allow up to five degrees based on the design where it hits against the post, some allow up to eight degrees. But generally, <clears throat> It is not a very, uh, it's not a design that is conducive or tolerant of hyperextension. So in a PS knee, avoid uh, laxity in extension. Keep it uh, reasonably snug fit in extension. The other problem with PS knees that has been sort of uh, very well uh, documented and proven is a higher risk of uh, intraoperative fracture. It is very low in incidence, but still much higher as compared to a CR knee. So, um, in one st large scale study of uh, uh, complications, they found out about 0.39% uh, uh, fracture rate with uh, PS knees. And this is not a very small number, which is about, uh, about, uh, about uh, 250 knee, knee joints. Uh, you can uh, end up uh, fracturing the condyles. So you have to be careful. So which steps uh, are known to fracture is mainly about, especially trialing uh, of PS knees. You made a box cut weaken the central uh, portion. So if you're not careful with the uh, trialing, either the, if you impact it too hard or you're not careful at the time of extracting the trial, you can fracture the femoral condyle. So <clears throat> even though the fracture rate is small with PS knees, it is almost five times as compared to CR knees. So we have to be careful preparation with the preparation of the blocks and trialing. So cruciate knee, uh, retaining knees come with their own set of challenges. <clears throat> So as I said, the native slope in, uh, uh, in the tibia or the natural tibia is uh, not 0 to 3 degrees as most of us would have thought after seeing a bunch of, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, PS knees. So uh, it's about 5 to 15 degrees. Uh, so if you <clears throat> do not give enough slope in a uh, cruciate uh, retaining knee, if you do not match the slope, so um, it can become tight in flexion. That is one of the central problems with the cruciate retaining knee. Sometimes even up to seven degrees slope may not be sufficient to open up the flexion space in CR knees. So this was a study where <clears throat> they looked at how the slope affects the flexion gap. So it is fairly significant depending on where you take the pivot point. So uh, if you have not given enough slope in a CR knee, it leads to tightness in flexion. That is what happens in, um, uh, in a CR knee that is not given enough slope. Um, and uh, we generally find this out at the time of trialing. We've done the tibial cuts, the femoral cuts. We put in um, 
the trial components and when we flex it there is a anterior tibia oh, okay. so when the tibia lifts off it indicates that there is tightness in flexion so you have to be careful of this tibia means So uh, this is generally in a CR knee. We manage this most of the time by using a technique called PCL recession. So where we sort of uh, uh, erase uh, a portion of the attachment of the PCL either from the tibia or the femur, or we can uh, do it in both. So it has to be sitting normally in the, on the tibia in about 90 degrees of flexion. If it is lifting off, then it is a sign that the PCL is tight and needs to be balanced. so this is how we do the pcl recession uh, i generally prefer to do it on the tibial side femur is nicely subluxed uh, backwards and uh, just about a, a millimeter or 2 millimeters from the anterior most end of the tibial insertion gives uh, sorts out the balancing issues most of the time <clears throat> so other ways of uh, dealing with the tight pcl in uh, cr knee this is a very common problem when uh, most of us uh, face when we start with the cr knee tightness in flexion so i'm just giving you a few uh, examples on how to deal with it we can under uh, anteriorize the femur by 1 to 2 mm you have to avoid oversizing the femur especially if you are using an anterior referencing system the flexion space is already tight if you um, oversize the femur it becomes even tighter so the other way to do it is by uh, giving more slope on the tibia so a lot of the femoral guides uh, have provision to anteriorize the femur by 2 mm and we have to sometimes use it uh, when we do crns so in summary <clears throat> the posterior roll back of the femur is the import is a very important phenomenon in human knee to achieve good flexion so the roll back in a pcl uh, in a cr knee is done through pcl retention the pcl is retained and that drives the roll back in a ps knee we have sacrificed both the cruciates and in this knee the cam post mechanism is engineered to drive the roll back and both cr and ps have shown good outcomes over a long period of time the central thing to remember in ps knees is that flexion gap loosens with pcl sacrifice the slope of the tibia should not be more than 3 degrees avoid undersizing the femur avoid over resection of the distal femur and ps knees cannot be left in hyper extension because it will impinge against the post so um, the ps knees are uh, at higher risk of intraoperative fracture so be careful when you trial and extract the trial in a ps knee cr knee um, the success or uh, the initial balancing will depend on how well you are able to reproduce the native uh, slope of the tibia and these are generally tighter in uh, flexion if you have not done a good balancing job so you look for the tibial lift off sign if you find it then either recess the pcl or anteriorize the femoral component by 2 mm or adjust the tibial scope yeah i think thank you uh, that's the end of my session be happy to take any questions if you have yeah thank you arun for the excellent uh, discussion and talk um there is a question um from the audience uh in case there is anterior tibial trail lift off how to determine whether the flexion gap is tight owing to a tight pcl or is it due to not having matched the tibial slope or what is the first thing to be done <coughs> yeah so i said uh, uh, lift off is indicative of a tightness in flexion so you have to generally revisit the steps which have been uh, which have gone wrong so generally at this time it is uh, i mean most of the surgeons would find it very hesitant to go and adjust uh, cuts at this point so most of us would first try and recess the pcl a little bit and uh, see if it solves the lift off problem and in most cases where there is minor lift off just pcl recession would do the job and uh, if it is not sorted out at this stage then you have to relook at whether you can anteriorize the femur or increase the tibial so we have to go back and check which is causing the problem whether it is femoral uh, uh, the uh, in, uh, the inappropriate sizing of the femur or is it the tibial slope whichever is causing the problem needs to be addressed but as i said this is generally a rarity most of the time If you find a, a lift off, then it is managed uh, most of the time with the PCL recession technique. 
and nowadays i mean i didn't want to bring in that uh, the concept of deep dish uh, into this and confuse things but if uh, i mean nowadays if you have to resist the pcl uh, fair amount then i generally go in and put in a deep dish insert uh, instead of a cr insert uh, some portion of the pcl is remaining and i uh, use a dish uh, deep ultra congruent or a deep dish insert in its place so that will sort of uh, give uh, double protection uh, or uh, an alternative mechanism as well exists for the posterior roll back yeah thanks um, so um, what do you think arun i mean worldwide i see that more and more people are now moving from a ps poly to a deep dish poly i mean if you see the american joint replacement registry the use of ps implant is going down whereas the use of ultra congruent poly is coming up sir uh, we have uh, reasonable mid term data to think that uh, cs uh, or the deep dish is uh, a reasonably acceptable alternative in current times but like any new uh, thing coming up uh, it is uh, i think it is not yet time tested so i mean i generally do not have it as the first option in uh, my case so what i i mean i generally most of my knees are cr so i do cr knees and if i have to sort of uh, resist the pcl a lot then i just uh, use a deep dish insert i don't i'm still not kept as kept that as a first choice but uh, i mean like what you are saying um, i was initially quite reluctant to use the deep dish insert because um, i mean it was quite new but uh, now i think maybe about 10% of my knees i'm uh, of my cr knees i'm converting to a deep dish if the, there is problems with the pcl balancing so we have uh, data to support it i mean uh, there's nothing wrong with using but i am just uh, i think uh, the final word is uh, yet to be said on the deep dish inserts yeah okay mm in a cr knee is there any role for doing a posterior capsular release prior, prior to pcl recession in case of a tight flexion gap the yeah, posterior capsule affects the extension gap more than exactly. the flexion gap so if you have a tightness in flexion um, generally a posterior capsular release is not not likely to help much so i would first try a pcl recession uh, and i mean i wouldn't keep a posterior I mean, uh, that is more for flexion deformities or tightness in flexion that i would think about uh, releasing a posterior capsule Manish, can I? Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a great knee surgeon, but uh, I uh, two two or three things. The fracture rate of the condyle and the PS knee, what he uh, described, was uh, slightly on the higher side. Only problem is the 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 size between one point five and two size, the smaller size, they are the problem. Large size usually have no no major issue, no major issue. I agree uh, with that that the condyle fracture rate is high. just to uh, one more one or two important things the pc with a gross deformed knees as you know the dr arun's uh, work arun mulaji's work as a pcl histological studies regarding the mechanoreceptors and other things uh, which has been very low as compared so we really do not know the pcl is really functioning extremely well or not that is one second other important thing uh, what about the rheumatoid patient uh, uh, whether you like to use them uh, cr knee because it has been reported that the uh, post about maybe 5 or 7 or 10 years down the line the rupture rate of the pcl is very very high uh, what do you think and uh, some of the articles saying the irradical uh, uh, paradox movement with the cr cr knee what, what is your opinion yeah uh, <clears throat> yes sir uh, so in uh, in a ps knee we achieve a very reproducible uh, roll back uh, from the mechanism in a cr knee if the if the pcl is not balanced well it can lead to a paradoxical anterior roll back if, it, if the pcl is very lax it can lead to a paradoxical roll back uh, is an uh, it's quite well published and uh, i think I, i also put up one slide where it showed the paradoxical anterior roll back with the cr knee that has uh, one of the articles by dr callaghan 
so uh, uh, it is known it can happen so if you are doing cr knees we have to make sure we balance the cruciate uh, the posterior cruciate quite well so that it is uh, reasonably uh, uh, taut in uh, flexion the other thing about rheumatoid knees uh, <clears throat> there have been fair amount of reports published on cruciate retaining uh, knees in rheumatoid as well and uh, there have been reports of rupture uh, but even fused knees uh, where uh, i mean if you go in i mean i have not done um, cr in a fused knee but pcl is still there and it is reasonably still i mean in uh, good shape even in a fused knee you can uh, once you take out things you can still the, see the pcl and it is still strong that is in rheumatoid knees so uh, the other question or uh, concern with the rheumatoid knees where i started shifting i was initially doing all ps knees for rheumatoids a uh, lot of the indian uh, patients with very small sizes uh, with uh, gross osteoporosis in rheumatoids uh, they are also more likely to sort of uh, fracture uh, with a ps knee and less with the cr knee so that was one concern that uh, should, i have done a fair number of uh, rheumatoids with uh, cr knees so but i sort of shifted more towards cr knees because of uh, this uh, uh, fracture uh, risk sir yeah okay now it was a nice lecture and uh, by, by good mechanics and uh, extremely well taken thank you very much sir so i think if there are no more questions uh, today we should thank dr arun for sparing time and dr pachore for guiding us and we will as soon as possible declare the time table for the next two sessions um so if you have any topics that the fellows want to know please send a message on the group because then i can tailor the talks accordingly but we will otherwise continue to go through the topics that dr pachore has sent but please give me your suggestions as well thank you Thank you Mahesh thank you thank you thank sir you. thank you Arun thanks thanks, thank thanks and bye bye